This is a revised version of the episode uploaded last week. Fortunately, our wide-awake friend Brett pointed out a major flaw. Thanks, Brett. I really do appreciate your input. Before Einstein, the ether, the tenuous, all-pervading medium of space, was an important part of physics. Maxwell derived his famous equations of electromagnetism based on the properties of the ether. He deduced the speed of light in the ether to be 1 over the square root of the magnetic permeability of the ether times the electrical permittivity of the ether. And it doesn't matter if you call it the ether or free space or the firmament of the heavens, they're all the same thing. This allows the speed of the earth through the ether to be measured. The earth, speeding through the ether at speed v, crashes into light approaching the earth at speed c with an impact speed of c plus v. Michelson and Morley's interferometer compared this light with light coming from the side. The size of the fringe shift in the interferometer would be a measure of the Earth's velocity. There was no fringe shift, meaning the velocity v equals naught. The Earth is not moving. Most scientists, including Einstein, were absolutely certain the Earth must be moving round the Sun at 100,000 kilometres an hour. So Einstein said, there can't be an ether, and an observer will always measure the speed of light to see no matter how the observer and the light source are moving. A French scientist called Sagnac built a turntable with a light source a semi-silvered mirror to split the beam of light into two and mirrors to reflect one beam clockwise around the table and the other anti-clockwise round the table. When the turntable wasn't moving, there was no change in the spacing of the diffraction fringes for the light going clockwise and anti-clockwise, since the ether was stationary. When the turntable was turning in the stationary ether, there was a fringe shift. The light travelling in the same direction as the rotation was catching up the retreating interferometer at speed c minus v. The light travelling in the opposite direction was meeting the approaching interferometer at c plus v. Sagnac took this as proof that the ether exists and light does not always strike an observer at the same speed c. Relativity believers said this was not a disproof of Einstein because the apparatus was turning and was not an inertial frame of reference. I think you can take that excuse with a pinch of salt. The great Professor Michelson built a very large apparatus in Chicago with a colleague called Gale. They had long pipes running east and west connected by long pipes running north and south. The idea was that the pipes on the south were moving faster than the pipes on the north. If the earth rotates from west to east and the lines of latitude become smaller as one moves towards the north pole, the south leg of the circuit inside the pipes would move through the stationary ether faster than the north leg. They used a beam splitter to send one beam of light round clockwise and one anti-clockwise. So the beam going round anti-clockwise would have a stronger ether headwind in the southern leg of the circuit and a weaker tailwind in the northern leg. The beam going round clockwise would have a stronger ether tailwind on the southern leg and a weaker headwind on the northern leg. Clockwise would get round the circuit quicker. The fringe shifts agreed with this. Michelson concluded that the ether exists and C plus V is not equal to C minus V. Light does not always strike an observer with the velocity C. Einstein seems to have never commented on these experiments. 
Later, in 1915, he brought out a theory which he called the general theory of relativity. In a series of lectures at Leiden, he admitted that the theory demands an ether. And he said that without an ether, there would be no possibility of existence for standards of space and time. In lectures in Japan, he also pointed out the need for the ether. He wrote a book, Sidelights on Relativity, in which he said that general relativity is unthinkable without the ether. But the relativity boffins put forward a refutation of Sanyak and Michelson and Gale using the abstruse mathematics of general relativity. Multidimensional tensors in space-time and non-Euclidean geodesics. So, they use general relativity, which requires an ether, to disprove experiments demonstrating the existence of the ether because special relativity can't allow an ether. Otherwise, how would they get out of the earth not moving? Well, the Bible says, if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. A number of people have realised that one really obvious problem with Einstein's whole story is that everything centres round an observer. Not only lengths, but space itself shrinks depending on the movement of an observer. Not only clocks, but time itself slows down depending on the movement of an observer. Well... Since there can be several observers in the world, and each of them makes space shrink according to his own movement, and each makes time slow down according to his own movement, then relativity must be just a theory about appearances and cannot be a theory about reality. A physicist I greatly admire, Professor Thomas G. Barnes, lamented that the effect of Einstein's relativity has been to remove common sense from physics and to replace it with mathematics. The majority of physicists insist that relativity is not a theory about appearances. It's a theory about reality. Well, they just prove Professor Barnes correct. But more sensible physicists tried to replace Einstein's relativity with versions which are not quite so idiotic. Perhaps the most impressive attempt was by Herbert Ives, who attempted to build a relativity based on the real centre of the universe. Of course, modern cosmology, which is solidly based on relativity, denies there is such a thing. But Ives wasn't stupid enough to buy that. His relativity never became popular. Stefan Marinov came up with a version which gained quite a lot of interest for a while. A version was put forward by Piotr Beckman, which makes the dominant field, not the observer, the centre of action. His version can explain two more phenomena than Einstein's version. He wrote a very interesting book, Einstein plus two, which contains the best illustration I've ever come across of the ridiculousness of making the observer the centre of everything. But ridiculous or not, Einstein's version is not questioned by the establishment, and there are constant claims that there are a vast number of experiments which prove it, and no other theory can explain those experiments. It's true that Einstein's relativity agrees with the results of many experiments. But the genuine ones are all of a very restricted nature. They deal with high-energy particles whose properties are not measurable with rulers and clocks or anything similar. Their values are deduced from other theories. Marinoff's and Beckman's theories explain them equally well. In fact, in all such experiments ever performed, 
the observer is stationary in the gravitational field. So there could be no way of saying they confirm Einstein, but not Beckman. Thomas Barnes showed that by dealing with elementary particles as 3D objects and not as points, relativity is not even needed to explain these experiments. Harold Aspton, in Physics Without Einstein, showed that physics makes more sense without Einstein's theory than with it. There have been attempts to confirm Einstein by flying clocks around the world. The inventor of the atomic clock, Louis Essen, denied that the stated results could have come from an atomic clock. Dr. A. G. Kelly showed that the published results were not the actual test results, so claims of larger scale proof are very dubious. Engineers and scientists working with satellites, radio transmission, etc., which deal with light and radio waves at long range, found that their observations did not agree with Einstein's relativity, but they were not allowed to publish their findings in the establishment journals. So Barnes, Beckman and others started a journal, Galilean Electrodynamics, where the truth could be published. That journal is published about once a month. Every edition has practical disproofs of Einstein's relativity. But it's not sanctioned by the establishment, and therefore what's published there is not counted as science. Now, in all this, I'm not trying to show that Einstein was a fraud or a fool. He was not. He was a great scientist, whose work on the photoelectric effect won a Nobel Prize, and whose work on Brownian motion could have won another. He was misled by indoctrination that the Earth is not stationary at the centre of the universe and he made an ingenious attempt to explain away the evidence that it is. In later life, he acknowledged that his relativity could be just a castle in the air. This, and his admission that physics is not possible without an ether, were never published by the establishment. And this whole story reminds me of Brian G. Wallace's statement in The Farce of Physics. The word scientist entered the English language in 1840. At that time, a handful of American scientists were taking steps to transform their status and image and separate themselves as professionals from those they considered amateurs. The major tactic used to create this artificial separation has been the elaborate use of technical jargon and complex mathematics. This erection of higher and higher barriers to the comprehension of scientific affairs is a threat to an essential characteristic of science, its openness to outside examination and appraisal. I think that history has shown that they were aiming up much more than just transforming their status and image. They've taken complete control of the whole profession of science. But we don't need to be afraid of all that technical jargon and complex mathematics. As Thomas Barnes pointed out, common sense in physics has been replaced by mathematics. When technical jargon and complex mathematics tells us stupid things, like space and time being distorted by the movement of an observer, or strings having up to 26 spatial dimensions, of which at least six are compactified, or that the universe has its centre everywhere and its edge nowhere, we only need a little bit of common sense to know it's not true. Remember, in real life, mathematics is not the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, 
please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.